Okay, this last lecture will kind of wrap up the Renaissance as far as um, where it goes. And a good place to start, and this is what I usually do in my real life classes, is to compare the style on the left, which we're going to call mannerism, and the style on the right with the same subject. And that makes it a little bit easier. So what I recommend you do is kind of pause the video and look at what's similar between the two and then look at what's different. And I think this will help you kind of understand the things that we're going to talk about in this particular section. So once you've written down some, th some things that have changed, uh, we can move on to the next section. So the style that we're talking about, we're gonna call mannerism. And at the time, um, people didn't necessarily use that word, um, but it was more art historians looking back. So think about what that might mean because oftentimes our kind of modern art history started in the 19th century and um, art historians at that time had a view that things like certain periods in ancient Greek history, and they even came up with the name the High Renaissance, that was kind of a value judgment on the art. Um, and that's not the type of thing that I would do in a class like this. So I think these styles are really cool, um, but because they differ from the naturalism and that kind of like balance um, and a little bit of holding back that we see in the high renaissance you don't see much holding back here um, it wasn't as popular so mannerism in some ways was 19th century art historians they called it that because they were kind of disparaging it to a certain extent so um, mannerism emerges about 1520 and the mannerist artists um, they've seen things happen they've seen um, the kind of like rational nationalism that we had in the early renaissance and then they saw that balance style um, that happened in the high renaissance and they want to do something different and we're going to see that happen throughout the class artists love novelty um, just like other types of culture um, so in some ways this is a response to um, the balance and the kind of low-key type of vibe that a lot of the high renaissance paintings have so they concentrate on things like artifice uh, anti-naturalism so they don't want to look real uh, virtuosity so part of the trick is to make these things that don't look real but still have them be graceful or beautiful or communicate something um, unbalanced compositions so they're not worried about that balance that we've been talking about uh, and a lack of a background so they press everything up against the picture plane part of the reason why this style is the way it is is because um, there's fewer of these kind of big commissions uh, that are coming from elite people. There's still commissions coming from elites, um, but some of them are uh, more just like recently wealthy people or some of those like Renaissance people that we were talking about before who are really well educated. Uh, and sometimes these artists want to kind of challenge their viewers a little bit. Uh, <laughs> and I think this still happens nowadays. Modern day artists, they, they uh, figure out that if you make fun of the rich person a little bit that wants to buy your art, they'll think you're cool and want to buy it. So we have a little bit of that going on um, where you put lots of random references in and there's a little bit of a cooler than thou vibe with mannerism. Uh, so this is Rosa Fiorentino uh, and this is the descent from the cross. And um, this is a pretty common theme and he's doing it in a way that is a little bit different. We don't see the composition where um, we kind of know where it's going or it's telling us a particular story. Instead, it's just all over the place. You can't like make one shape. There's many shapes going on. The other thing that we see is the colors are all over the place, like the flesh tones. Um, Jesus looks green. Um, we see that uh, some of the other figures, they have uh, various flesh tones going on. So uh, the green kind of works, though, if you think this is a dead person. Um, he's still looking like he just drifted off to sleep, not like he's been tortured. Uh, but you can see how the space is kind of lacking and there's lots of emotion. So there's lots of twisting and, and lots of lines that are going in different directions. And that kind of gives the feeling sometimes to some viewers that there's a lot of motion going on. So the trick with this is to kind of stretch the figures like Michelangelo was doing at this time. 
um, but do it in such a way that's more a style statement and less about like what Michelangelo was doing and try to say these are big people doing big things. Instead, the artists are kind of trying to show off their virtuosity where they can mold things however they want and place things however they want. It still looks right or it still looks beautiful. Uh, so this is Jacopo da Pontormo, uh, and it's the same subject we saw before. And you see how he's doing something similar. We don't even have a cross anymore. Uh, we just have a bunch of people slapped up against a picture plane um, and, you know, all kinds of lines going in all different directions. There's no, I mean, I guess you could say there's kind of a diamond composition, uh, but it's not a composition that's telling a story. You know, Leonardo might be kind of annoyed by some of this. Um, so the bearded man uh, that we see right here, that's probably a self-portrait, but you'll kind of notice in a way uh, they're working like some of those late Gothic paintings we looked at in the beginning of the class and that the faces are all kind of similar. Um, but we do have a very dead looking Jesus with the coloring in his lips and his eyes, uh, but everybody else is this kind of like pink tone and the colors are more about um, colors that seem to look pretty together rather than making something that makes a particular statement. Uh, so when you get in close, there's some weird things that are going on. Uh, Manners artists, they don't care if the body parts connect correctly. It's like if they want to put a head here, that's where they're going to put it, even though you're trying to figure out, well, where is this guy's shoulder? Um, Where's this hand coming from? Where are all these, coming, all these things coming from? It's really hard to trace because they're not limiting themselves to how the body actually works like a high Renaissance artist would do, um, but more like what Michelangelo had been doing uh, by this time. And then we see, you can kind of see how the faces, they're all very similar, beautiful, uh, but a lot of similarity and lots of drama. Um, we see lots of kind of dramatic facial expressions and dramatic poses. Uh, we're not this relaxed kind of style like, like we'd see in some of the high Renaissance artists, except of course, Michelangelo. Um, you get in close. Um, this face is the most regularly shaped round face you would ever see, but still, uh, has a certain amount of beauty to it. Um, and if you look at this figure, uh, it seems like his neck is coming out of one shoulder and then we have all this other shoulder somehow holding up Jesus again. So like even the way that individual body parts connect in the same body isn't really important. It's more um, they place things where they want to um, and they can make those types of choices. Um, this like huge bridge to the nose. Uh, I think normally if you saw somebody like that in real life, you might think, well, they're kind of strange looking. Uh, but that's the trick to make things that would normally be strange or even uh, grotesque from a certain way and make them look beautiful. Um, and that's part of the artist showing off, part of showing off their virtuosity. Uh, so probably the best example of these artists is Parmigianino. Oh, he's born Francesco Mazzola. That's kind of boring. It's nothing like Parmigianino, which is uh, uh, much cooler. Um, <clears throat> although the meaning isn't necessarily cool. You can look that up. Uh, it's his self-portrait in a convex mirror. Uh, he's a teenager as he looks in this picture. Um, and he's, you know, trying to show off a little bit. Um, he's showing how he can get the distortion of his face in this mirror that is curved and painting it um, so that it looks like it's curved. Uh, so apparently the Pope saw this particular picture and was like, give this kid some money. <laughs> uh, and he was able to get a lot of good commissions uh, because it was so impressed um, by the technical uh, ability of this young man. Um, so when you get in close, very young man, reminds me of a friend of mine. Um, so this is his most famous painting. Uh, and it's a Madonna of the Long Neck. And we saw that uh, compared to the Raphael, you probably wrote down things like, wow, this is a lot different. There's not the same kind of spaces. Like, uh, you know, <laughs> the proportions are very weird. Uh, and there's a bunch of things going on in the background, maybe that you don't understand. Uh, so there's a couple of things going on, uh, according to this art historian, whose name I can't pronounce. It's influenced by Raphael which makes sense. Raphael is known for Madonnas and Parmigianino wants to kind of show off that he can do them. Um, there was a medieval hymn comparing her neck to ivory columns. So it may be why he has this very like shimmery kind of broken 
uh, or a column that's not supporting anything in the background. And then she just has like a ridiculously long neck. So it's called Madonna and the Long Neck, but remember the artists at this time, they didn't name their paintings. So people just saw it and said, look, it's Madonna with a long neck. <laughs> and that's what it came to be called. But, you know, Parmigian and Eno just painted it and didn't say what it was called. But what you might notice about this, remember when we were talking about Michelangelo and his Pieta, uh, and how kind of huge and massive uh, the hips of Mary was, uh, Parmigian Nino is saying, yeah, I can do that one better. Uh, look at the, I mean, the Spanish from here to here, uh, an amazing amount of hips, but she still looks delicate with these long fingers and this long neck. Um, all of these details and the cloak that's clinging to her body so it can show off how we can do the female form in an acceptable way because you're not supposed to show Mary nude, uh, but also um, how to show off all of these folds. Uh, so very good stylistic choice there. And then you can see all of these angelic figures. It's just heads and they're sort of connected to bodies, but they're sort of not. They're just all smashed up into the, to the picture. Um, and then in the background, we have a figure that's kind of mysterious. Again, remember their audience. They're trying to like kind of fool them or show that they're uh, be challenging or, or even have the artist show that they're smarter than their audience. Uh, so they don't necessarily explain these things. Uh, but we do have some ideas and I'll, we'll go over that. The other thing you might notice is this is a giant Jesus baby. <laughs> no baby is this huge. And Mary herself, if she were to stand up, what would she be like 10, 12 feet tall? Um, but yet she still looks delicate. So um, this in almost impossible balance of qualities is part of what makes mannerism interesting, to me at least. Um, so you can see that he started out with a more um, kind of conventional type of proportions for the figure, still like a pretty solid base. Um, but you know, over time he made it much wider. And it's funny because he's still doing kind of like the pyramid form, but uh, just massively exaggerated. So when you get in close, you can see it has a sash, just like Michelangelo had done, um, and everything clean to her body. Again, it would be taboo to show Mary nude, but these artists want to show off. So um, he wants to show as much of his body as he can and not break the taboo. So this figure in the background, it's kind of a mystery. Um, you can see that uh, Parmigian Nino signed his name right there, F. Mazzoli. Um, but there's a couple of ideas of what it could be. It's kind of strange. A lot of times students in class, I mention, is he a ghost? Because he seems to be fading away. Um, maybe. <laughs> his skin is orange, which is very strange. Uh, but he's holding a scroll and he's portrayed as this young man who, or, or as an old man who is still very like fit and kind of like, you know, ripped. Um, and that is a common way to so, show St. Jerome, uh, who traditionally translated, he's a historical figure, who traditionally translated the Bible from its many languages into Latin. And that was the Bible that people were still using at this time. But that happened in the, in the uh, third or fourth century. But he's commonly portrayed in these pictures um, because he's a way to kind of show the idea of the passion of the Christ and how Christians uh, can truly kind of experience the passion by reading the scriptures and get a feeling for what it's like for Christ's sacrifice. Um, so often, um, often he's shown in that way. Um, so with this one, St. Jerome is shown with an orange cloak. Uh, and we have St. John the Baptist with a lot of flair with his pointing. Uh, and we see that uh, this is a part of me, Giannino picture. So St. Jerome um, could be him, but we can't tell. Instead of having an orange cloak, he has orange skin. Uh, so it's really difficult to know what's going on. This one is at the DIA, and it's about the silliest subject. <laughs> but since he's such an important painter, they have this tiny little painting uh, displayed prominently in the section with other artists from this time period in Italy. Uh, so if you want to see the circumcision, uh, hit it up. Like Jesus seems none concerned uh, about what's about to happen to him. So this last artist is continuing the ideas we had before, where it's more like the artist will just place parts of bodies in the picture where they like it. 
uh, and won't necessarily worry about naturalism. Uh, and having like things that are kind of lightweight or even a little bit taboo, like Parmigianino was doing uh, with Mary's body. So this is called the allegory of Venus. An allegory is, and this is important to remember, the expression by means of symbolic fictional figures and actions of truth or generalizations about human existence. In an allegory and art, each image has a specific meaning. So allegories are more specific than symbolism. They're a type of symbolism, but it's not up to the viewer. It's like this, this means this exactly, and, and the artist decides beforehand. So this kind of appeals to the audience at the time that would want to be able to figure out all the different uh, pieces of iconography in the allegory. Uh, so Cupid and Venus, uh, the specific meaning is incest. Uh, it's part of the story. Um, we have time on the upper right corner. Uh, and that's partially like a Christian thing where it's like, yeah, you may find these things pleasurable that are taboo in life, uh, but time is coming to take you away eventually. And then roses, which are thrown by fate. Uh, so a lot of times in these Greek stories are kind of appealing to people because these gods and goddesses, um, they do human stuff. They mess up a lot. Uh, so sometimes fate will bring people together into things that are uh, taboo or, um, but, you know, he tries to make this taboo thing as, as enticing as possible. Um, so you can see here, Cupid and Venus, uh, brother and sister. The mask is deceit. Uh, and some of these masks are kind of based on the type of mask that they would have used in the ancient Greek theater, uh, the tragic theater. Uh, and then we have envy over here. Uh, so <laughs> um, I think nowadays they would call it fear of missing out. <laughs> uh, so this figure was like uh, kind of thinking, I, I would like to get in on, on some of this taboo action. When you get in close, um, that baby has no knuckles. <laughs> uh, so um, extra cute. Uh, you can see it's not quite as painterly as the styles we're going to see later on, but there is some showing off with the paint strokes a little bit. Um, and we get in close uh, with time. Looks very kind of Michelangelo godlike, no? Uh, and then the artist Bronzino who, by the way, has a great piece of the DIA. It's one of my favorite pieces there. Uh, this is a portrait. And remember, portraits were being taken more and more seriously. We'll see through time how that works out. Um, and he's doing Anolo di Cosimo di Mariano. Um, and as you can see, <laughs> I usually ask the class, what do you think of this guy? Uh, and most people say, well, he's very confident. Uh, and some people will say, well, he seems kind of like a douchebag. <laughs> um, or some people say, you know, I want to be like him someday. So uh, he definitely, with his hand on his hip and he's staring straight at us and sticking his chest out, and, um, you know, he's kind of confident. But he's also trying to show himself as an educated man. Uh, so he's wearing the hat of the artist that we had talked about before. Uh, he's got his finger in a book. But... Um, I wonder if Franz, you know, is kind of uh, making fun of him a little. He has a couple of these symbols that are reminders of death. Uh, so maybe he's talking about this wealthy young man um, who commissioned this portrait uh, and looks at him so proud uh, and has his hand in a book. And um, think of kind of like the joke when you have someone who wants to pretend that they're smart and they've read lots of books. Um, they'll, they'll kind of be looking like they're reading a book, but it will be upside down or something like that. So maybe he's one of those guys that's, that's faking it. Um, and these reminders of Jeff say, hey, there's no reason to fake it. You only have one physical life to live, and then you have an attorney to deal with it. I also love how he's wearing a pinky ring, which is very Italian in my opinion. So sometimes people mention his eyes are kind of going uh, two different ways. Um, that may be a possibility and may be showing like exactly how his eyes were in real life. Uh, it may be that, you know, Bronzino is just going for a strange effect with the way that he stares at us. Um, and then you see these details on the furniture, not in real furniture, because that would be strange. Uh, but they're kind of reminders of death, you know, all these nice things that you have, you're all going to die. So um, better sure that you're doing right for yourself. Uh, and the pinky ring and more of these reminders of death on the furniture. So a lot of the artists, including Correggio, uh, they do get some big commissions, um, but they're still using some of these styles, you know, this mass of figures kind of populated together. 
but they're also trying to do some of the things that people did in the early Renaissance where you have these illusions. Uh, so uh, when you look at the ceiling, um, it looks like it just disappears into forever. It's called the assumption of the virgin. So the subject is that subject that we were talking about, the idea of making the virgin into something special, the Virgin Mary. Um, so it's believed that uh, when she died, instead of being buried in the ground, that she was assumed up to heaven bodily. Um, and it's not uh, in the Bible exactly. So it's one of those stories kind of showing that Mary is special and, and like uh, kind of contributing to this cult of Mary. No, but it's done in a really cool way. There's this kind of firmament of clouds made and all these figures are populated and we see them from below. Uh, really cool. Um, he was a competitor of Parmigianino, not appreciated in his time. Appreciated by somebody because they paid him to paint this ceiling. Uh, but he's certainly been appreciated since. Um, really cool effect uh, from below to above. Um, he influenced a lot of the Baroque painters, and I think you'll see what we're talking about. Uh, Michelangelo was a big influence, and in, obviously the Venetian painters, as we talked about before. So really cool. It has some effects like in um, the uh, Last Judgment um, from Michelangelo, so some similar ideas. <laughs> and this guy just takes a leap. I don't know if anyone's going to save him. And then around, we have these figures to kind of just like decorate the panels. Uh, and John the Baptist. So this one has a little story. Um, when you first look at it, you may think there's just one figure in a cloud. But if you look closely, uh, there's actually a face. It's right here. Um, so this is Jupiter, who's Zeus in Greek mythology, same guy. Uh, and if you've read some Greek mythology, you know that Zeus is fond of the mortal women. Uh, so he'll pretty much do anything so he can get with them. Um, and this is one of those cases. Uh, he sees Io, this beautiful mortal woman, and he decides that he's going to be do what only gods can do. He's going to make himself into a cloud and then um, embrace her and kiss her. How can you compete with that? Uh, that's, a really, that's a really good move. Um, so kind of like what we saw with the Raphael, like light mythology, some of this stuff is that idea, but it has what we've seen um, in mannerist styles so far in that everything is up against a picture plane. Um, and I mean, her proportions look pretty real, but you know, it's a kind of fantastical subject. Um, you can see the face being made here uh, and she's de it's definitely working for her, right? So this is Paolo Veronese, uh, and it's Christ in the House of Le Levi. It was originally going to be a Last Supper, and it sure looks like one, right? Because we got all these people across the table. Um, and, and it was put in a place where a Last Supper goes. It was painted for a dining hall of Santi Giovanni e Paolo in Venice. Um, and what Veronese de did here was what people would do more and more often, and we're going to see it in later styles a lot, um, is he put contemporary people, uh, and you can see some here, dressed in contemporary clothes, among the biblical figures. Um, and some of them represent real people. So people he saw on the street or entertainers or friends of his. Uh, and that's the reason why it's not the Last Supper anymore, because they thought eh, it's too important of a subject to put contemporary people in it. Um, and there also might be kind of like a racist angle I uh, remember there was already um, European imperialism was in full swing at this time. Uh, and by putting um, black figures and figures from the Middle East, um, some of the people might have thought, okay, that makes it less important or something like that. Um, so it was changed. <laughs> he just said, okay, it's the same painting, but I'm going to call it uh, Christ in the House of Levi, which is a lesser story. So it would be okay for that painting is massive. As you can see, it's 42 feet wide. So these figures are life-sized uh, when you get up on them. Um, and it shares a lot of things that we had seen uh, in the Last Supper, like from Leonardo. We can see that it's centered and all the lines kind of lead towards Jesus and he's got a little halo, uh, but a lot more going on and a lot more 
colors going on as well. Um, so you get in close. Venetians are really good uh, with the oil and you can get so many different colors, literally millions and lots of saturation. Um, so, so some figures of um, different areas of the world. Uh, so African figures in here as well. And again, like it's partially kind of a racist idea to say, oh wait, if you have Africans in here, it can't be a good subject. And what's happening with this is the Holy Office of the Inquisition. Uh, this is going to become more important. I'll kind of talk about the so-called Reformation a little bit later on, but that's when some Christians leave the Catholic Church, uh, and that causes a lot of uh, political changes uh, that are going to change the subjects of the art that we're going to look at. Um, so contemporary figures. <laughs> some people eat well and dress well. So this last one um, from Giacobo Tintoro, Tintoretto is going to be the one that's the most like the Baroque style, which we're going to study later on. And the Baroque style starts in about 1600 with Caravaggio, who we'll talk about uh, later. So this is pretty close to it, uh, what the Baroque will eventually become, like some of the, the formal themes. Uh, and this is his Last Supper and quite different than what we had seen from Leonardo's Last Supper or even the previous one. Um, so sometimes I ask the students, where do you think this is taking place? Uh, and they see the ceiling and see it's dark and they're like, it looks like it's like in a basement or something like that. And people thought that when they saw it. Uh, but it would make sense if you think about it because uh, Jesus was just uh, some homeless guy, uh, didn't have a lot of money. So if they are gonna have this supper with his followers, he would just do it wherever he could. Uh, so in what looks like some kind of like dive tavern or dive bar or something like that kind of makes sense. Um, the technique that he's using is going to be very popular in the following style, the Baroque, and that's known as tenebrism. So tenebrism is basically taking the idea of chiaroscuro, the light and dark, uh, and making it more extreme. So you have very, very dark darks and very, very light lights. Uh, and we see kind of a symbolism with the bright whites uh, and the darkest darks. Uh, so you kind of notice that the table makes a line uh, and mostly on one side of the table, we see kind of earthly things like we see animals, uh, we see people preparing food and contemporary clothes. Uh, and then the other side is more of a spiritual side. We can see all these uh, kind of floating spirits and Jesus and all of the apostles. Uh, except for one, Judas uh, is on the spiritual side. So Judas is on these other sides. And by putting the animals, the cats and dogs and such, it shows uh, kind of like that theme we were looking at before, uh, the profane and the sacred. Um, but what's kind of cool with this is I think most people, when they first see the picture, their eyes brought immediately to that bright light in the middle and you see Jesus. So in this case, using light uh, as much as the composition. Uh, to be able to um, bring our attention. So this idea of mixing contemporary figures uh, with the Jesus story is going to become more popular, and the Reformation is going to be part of the reason why, which I'll explain when we get to the Baroque. Uh, but it's basically a way for Catholics to uh, keep people interested um, and prevent them from leaving. So you can kind of pair it, compare his picture to Leonardo's. And this is a good place to stop. Um, so uh, this will be all for the first test. And uh, we'll start with the Baroque after the first test is completed.